Okay, time for unit five. On to kinetics. This is a unit that's like separated from chemistry in terms of like the periodic table and atoms and molecules and reactions and all that. It's more just principles this time around. Okay, so let's get into it. What exactly is kinetics? So kinetics is a term we use to describe um, how fast a reaction happens, okay? So why don't I start us off with a simple chemical equation? Okay, so I'm going to have methane, CH4. In kinetics, we'll see that when we input one mole of methane into the reaction vessel, that will produce, let's say, two moles of H2O. Okay, so that means that over the course of the reaction, the concentration of CH4, that's what these little hard brackets mean, they mean concentration of, the concentration of CH4 will decrease at a certain rate, and the concentration of H2O will increase at precisely double that rate, okay? Because as one mole of this is consumed, two moles of that are produced. And the same can be said for oxygen as the concentration of oxygen decreases at a certain rate, let's say uh, two moles per second, I don't know, I'm making something up, and we look at CO2, the concentration of CO2 will increase at precisely one mole per second, exactly one half of this, because on this side, two are consumed to make one of this. So this will be formed at half the rate this is consumed. In uh, reaction rates, we have something called the rate law. Now, the rate law is an equation. It's an equation that you will be asked to derive, that you'll be asked to build. General form is rate equals K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B dot dot dot, depending on if you have more species present, okay? So let's dissect what this means. Rate it refers to the total rate of the whole reaction, okay? How fast are reactants being turned into products? That's what rate represents. K is a constant, and it will be different for every chemical equation, it will be different for every reaction, but it is a constant throughout the entire reaction. Concentration of A means the concentration of some species A, B is the concentration of some species B, and we're going to get into exactly how to uh, write a rate law equation, okay? So on the AP exam, very, very common type of FRQ. I would say you're pretty much guaranteed to get this FRQ on your AP exam. Um, they would give you a table that looks something like this, okay? And uh, let's say here is initial rate. Here they put concentration of A, here they put concentration of B, okay? So we're given a table like this, all right? And our job is to figure out what exponents A and B should have, all right? We would have a chemical equation like that, and we would have a table of values here based off the concentration of A, concentration of B, and the initial rate, meaning how fast is the reaction initially before the concentrations have any time to decrease. So, like I showed you here before, the rate is related to the concentration of some of the reactants. Now if we look here, when the concentration of A is 1 and B is 1, we have 10. When we double the concentration of A, we double the initial rate, okay? So what does that tell me? It means I doubled A, I multiplied this by 2, and I doubled the rate, so I multiplied this by 2. Therefore, rate is directly proportional to the concentration of A. So this would have an exponent of 1, okay? Because if I double this, I double that. Now let's take a look at B. In this second row, third row I should say, in the third row the concentration of A remains constant, and the concentration of B doubles, okay? 
Concentration of A remains constant, concentration of B doubles. But the initial rate did not change, okay? B doubled, but the rate did not change. Therefore, B has an exponent of zero. And if it has an exponent of zero, it means it's not part of our equation. And let me give you a final example just to illustrate another thing. Let's say I erased all of this and the initial rate was 40 when concentration of A was 2. Okay? So we start out with concentration of A and B, 1, 1, 10. Concentration of B remains the same, and we double concentration of A. In doubling concentration of A, our initial rate is multiplied by 4. Okay? So, what does that tell me? It means when I multiplied this by 2, I multiplied the rate by 2 squared, which is 4, okay? Which means that if you were to see this, the exponent of a would not be 1, it would be 2, right? Because if I double a now, that means this side is multiplied by 2 squared. So it all depends on this graph you're given, okay? So why was it important for us to figure out the uh, exponents that belong to each of our reactants? Now that you have all of your exponents figured out, they're going to ask you questions like, what is the order of this reaction? The order just means sum up all the exponents in your rate law equation. This reaction is therefore second order, okay? If it asks you, what order is this reaction with respect to the concentration of A? You'd say, this reaction is second order with respect to concentration of A. If the, they asked you what order is the reaction with respect to concentration of B, you would say it's zeroth order with respect to concentration of B. And you do the same for one. It's first order with the respect to concentration of whatever. Okay? A very common type of FRQ. It's not that hard to understand if you just know how to analyze what concentration of A and uh, concentration of B and how they relate to the rate. All right? So, once you solve all this out, once you finish building your equation with respect to what's in the table, you still now have this rate constant K that you need to figure out. And the way you solve for rate constant K is, again, you look at the table. You choose any row you want. Let's say I chose this row. And you plug things in. Okay. Rate. What's my rate? 40 equals K. What's my concentration of A? 2. What's 2 squared? 4. Concentration of B? Doesn't matter. Anything to the 0 power is 1. Therefore, I can just solve for K. K equals 10. And now I can write the complete rate law equation. Rate equals K times the concentration of A squared times the concentration of B to the zeroth power. You don't need to write that. I always recommend you do. You don't, I mean, you don't need to write the B section, but I always recommend you do. If something is to the zeroth power, I always recommend you include it because the AP graders are under the assumption that you're stupid and you don't know anything, okay? So you need to go above and beyond to prove to them you know your stuff, right? They're going to grade you harshly if they think you're stupid and don't know anything. They're looking for reasons to prove that you don't know your stuff. It's a very common type of multiple choice question as well. They would give you uh, a rate law equation and they'd say, what is the rate with, what is the uh, order of the reaction with respect to B? You know, and if B just so happened to be 1, you'd say it's first order with respect to B. And now the entire, uh, the entire reaction would be third order. Because there are uh, other types of ways to determine the rate of a reaction, independent of being given this type of chart. So, in terms of analyzing the concentrations of uh, different species at any point in time during a reaction, there are four equations on your reference table that I'm going to need to introduce you to now, okay? So, there's one for zero order. 
So the first one is for zero order reactions. Okay, that equation is the concentration of A at time t minus the concentration of A naught equals negative kT. Okay, so that means the concentration of A at any time t, t is, you know, let's say after two seconds, minus the initial concentration of A equals negative one times the rate constant multiplied by the amount of time elapsed. Okay, so in this case that would be two. So let's say, let's use parts of the table so I can give you an example. Let's say this is um, after two seconds. No, no, we're not going to use parts of the table. So they'd ask you, okay, here's the, they'd give you, here's the concentration of A after two seconds. They would give you, here's the initial concentration of A. Find the rate constant, okay? And you'd plug in the initial concentration of A. You plug in the concentration of, ray, of A after two seconds. They gave you T, two seconds, and now you solve for K. Okay, similar process with uh, first order. First order is the natural log of the concentration of A at time t minus the natural log of the concentration of A initially equals the negative k times time. Yep, so same principle applies. They're going to tell you if it's a zero order or a first order, or if it's an FRQ, you're going to decide that for yourself. And once you figure out whether you're dealing with zero, first order, or second order, there's another equation for second order, you're going to decide which equation to use, and you're just going to plug in the values that you're given. Okay? Next equation is that for second order, obviously. That's 1 over the concentration of A at time t, concentration of A at 2 seconds, whatever it is, minus 1 over concentration of A at time zero equals, pay attention, kT. There's no negative here. So, important thing to note. Very often on the multiple choice section and sometimes on the uh, FRQ, they're going to give you a graph, okay? And they're going to give you a graph of concentration of a with respect to time t, okay? Meaning that they're gonna give you a graph and on the x-axis they're gonna plot time, on the y-axis they're gonna plot concentration of A, okay? In the case of a zero order reaction, in the case of zero order reaction, you would get a linear line when you plot with respect to concentration of A. In the case of a first order reaction, you would get a linear line when you plot with respect to natural log of A. And in the case of second order, you would get a linear graph when you plot one over concentration of A. But in that case, it would not be this linear, it would be that linear. Because there's no negative here. So the, the slope is inverted. But anyway, you just need to know it's linear, okay? It's a very common type of multiple choice questions. Either they ask you, okay, I have a second order reaction. What do I need to plot in the y-axis to yield a linear graph? And you'd say one over concentration of A. Or they're going to ask you, I plotted a natural log of A with respect to time and I got a linear graph, what order is the reaction? Okay, there's like three-ish multiple choice problems, maybe four on that, and it's probably going to pop up in your rate law FRQ. Because like I said before, there's always a rate law FRQ, always. And one more equation. This equation is exclusively for first order reactions. You cannot use this equation for anything else, okay? In a first order reaction, 
a first order reaction has something called a half-life. Okay? For those of you who don't know what a half-life is, it means that there is a constant time period, let's say for example five seconds, there's a constant time period such that every five seconds the concentration of reactants is cut in half. Okay, so if I start with 16, I'm going to specify units later, if I start with 16 concentration of reactants, after five seconds I'm going to have eight, after another five seconds I'm going to have four, after another five seconds I'm going to have two, after another five seconds I'm going to have one, you, you see where I'm going with this, that's called a half-life, and it's characteristic of exclusively first order reactions. And the equation for that is uh, T one half meant to represent the half-life, T one-half, equals 0 0.693 over K. All right, all these four equations are on your reference table, no need to memorize them, but you do need to know how to use them. All right, now let me get into units, all right? So like we covered back in solution, concentration of B is in units of concentration. It's in units of molarity, moles per liter, right? So the concentration of anything, concentration of Z, is in moles per liter, all right? All concentrations are in moles per liter. Moving on from there, your rate, your overall rate of your reaction, this term right here, is in units of molarity per second, okay? Now, you're going to have to be careful here, because sometimes on some FRQs, they give you moles per minute, or they ask you with, uh, they give you a problem with reaction rate in hours, so you're just going to have to be conscious as to the time units you're given in your specific problem, okay? It doesn't have any bearing on how you solve the problem, but if you put your final answer in the wrong units, that's a big problem. So, let's rewrite our equation. See, rate in terms of uh, molarity, I should erase these OLs, molarity, capital M, per hour, equals K times the concentration of A to the 1 times the concentration of B to the 1, let's say, 1. So again, concentrations are in units of molarity. Molarity, if this was second order, this would be molarity squared, but yeah, let's continue with it being a second order, all right? So on this side, we've got units of molarity per hour. On this side, we've got K times molarity to the third, okay? So on this side, I've got these units. On this side, I've got different units. The rate constant K will need to account for that disparity in units. So whatever you calculate K to be, K will have to equalize these units. So, I've got an M to the third here, I've got an M here. That means that K needs to have units of 1 over M squared. And I've got an hour here, so it needs to have units of 1 over M squared times hours. Okay? So, that's the gist of it. You need to remember that your rate, your left side of the equation, is in units of molarity per hour. And anything that has the brackets, anything that is concentration, is in units of molarity. Makes sense, okay? So you take into account the exponents, and you figure out what units your right side of the equation is, and you then you need to determine what units of k. I always recommend writing out the equation like this so you can see which units of k you need to equalize the units on either side of the equal sign. Because, as you might infer, the units of K will not always be the same. The units of K will be different if you have a zero-order reaction, a first-order reaction, a second-order reaction, and so on and so forth. In this case, we have a third-order reaction, so we have 1 over molarity squared per hour. Very oftentimes, you will be asked exclusively for the units of K. On the multiple choice, sometimes they don't even ask you to solve for K, they just ask you what are the units of K. On the FRQ, there's a subsection of the FRQ usually that's solve for K and give correct units. So moving on from there, we're going to build up a second 
sort of topic and we're going to unite it into what rate is. That's the topic of reaction mechanisms. Okay, what is a reaction mechanism? All right, so first and foremost, the majority of reactions do not happen in a single step. So let's get into exactly how do reactions happen, okay? So let me continue with this. Methane reacting with oxygen. In a reaction, for a reaction to take place, you know, you've got a vessel and you've got particles in that vessel. Let's call this a methane molecule. Let's call this an oxygen molecule, okay? So these molecules, they're floating around in the reaction vessel, minding their own business, and then they collide, okay? At that collision, there is a possibility for a reaction to happen. So what do I mean when I say possibility? Let's go over the requirements, okay? So let me draw out the molecules to better illustrate this. In order for the reaction to happen, one, the particles must have sufficient energy. Energy, in this case, means speed. They must be moving fast enough to cause a powerful collision. Because, like we said before, bonds need to be broken in order for new bonds to be formed. So, this initial energy, the two particles need to have enough energy such that their collision breaks bonds. Okay? That's the first thing. The particles must have sufficient energy to react. That is called the activation energy. An activation energy is the necessary level of energy that particles need in order for the reaction to start. Activation energy is usually uh, something that is controlled by temperature, because as you raise temperature, you increase the speed of the particles so they have more energy to collide. Two, they must collide with the correct orientation, okay? Okay, so. We're trying to form water. We're trying to form an, a molecule that looks like this, okay? So the oxygen of the oxygen atom, the oxygen molecule, needs to collide with the methane such that it abstracts both hydrogens. Abstracts means removes. It would need to collide like right around there. Now, I'm simplifying this a bit because mechanisms is a much more advanced topic that's beyond the scope of AP Chemistry. They're pretty much teaching you really basic mechanisms here. So, the oxygen needs to collide such that it would abstract both hydrogens. If it were to collide another way, such that if it only collided with one uh, hydrogen, then the resulting product would be something like a peroxide, and the other oxygen would abstract the other hydrogen and you would get hydrogen peroxide in that case. So, but the reason that hydrogen peroxide doesn't form in this reaction is because hydrogen peroxide has a much higher activation energy. Okay, so it needs to have the correct orientation to react. The more collisions you have with correct orientation, the faster the reaction takes place. The more collisions you have with enough energy to surpass the activation energy barrier, the faster the reaction is going to happen. So the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that we learned back in um, the gas law unit was, uh, it looked a little something like a normal distribution if you studied statistics, and it had energy, no, frequency plotted on the y-axis, relative frequency, and energy plotted on the x-axis, okay? So in these rate law problems, they would give you like a little dashed line somewhere on the graph, and that would intersect energy, and this would be your activation energy, commonly abbreviated as EA, because that makes a, a lot of sense. So, you'd say, th all of these particles over here do not have enough energy to yield good collisions, to yield proper collisions, so they don't react. So, what happens when we decrease temperature? When we decrease temperature, the Boltzmann distribution constricts itself like that, and it moves closer down here. In this case, a lot more particles do not have sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy barrier. 
So by decreasing the temperature, we reduced the reaction rate. So I told you I was going to get into mechanisms. Let's get into mechanisms now. So like I was saying, lots of chemical reactions do not happen in one collision. Okay? They happen in a massive series of collisions. So methane, I don't know the reaction mechanism for the combustion of methane. But uh, let me make one up for you that's probably not correct, just to give you an idea of what's going on here, okay? Oxygen molecule collides with the methane to produce a C that's missing two hydrogens and an oxygen um, with two hydrogens, molecule of water, okay? In addition to a free oxygen atom. That's our first step. These collide to produce one uh, H2O molecule, one free oxygen, and one CH. Then the next step, CH, maybe it collides with oxygen again. Well, maybe it collides with the free oxygen atom. Okay? And that yields another H2O plus a free carbon. Okay, next step, the free carbon collides with uh, the oxygen molecule to yield CO2. Okay, so that would be a reaction mechanism. First, this collision happens and it produces these three particles. Then this collision happens and it produces these two particles. Then this collision happens and it produces that particle, okay? So, your reaction mechanism should always correspond to your original chemical equation. We start out with one methane and one oxygen, okay? And we produce one of this, whatever that is, one H2O and we have one free photoloading oxygen, okay? We see those are consumed in our next step. So we can, just like in pre-calc when you did systems of equations, we cancel out like terms. And in this case, we produce another water, another free carbon. Free carbon is present on the same side here, so we cancel that out. And now let's look at everything on that remains on either side of our equal sign. One methane, one CH4, plus 1, 2, O2 two becomes 1, 2, H2O plus 1, CO2, okay? So, if you cancel out all of the, um, so I like to call them like terms in your mechanism, then you should yield the exact same reaction you started with, okay? So, in a mechanism, these things that I crossed out right here are called intermediates. The C bonded to two hydrogens was an intermediate. Specifically, what an intermediate is defined as, it is something that is produced in the reaction and it is consumed such that it does not exist on the reactant side and it does not exist on the product side. It is produced only to be consumed in a later step, okay? Same thing can be said for the free oxygen atom. That's what an intermediate is, okay? So, uh, let me show you how this pertains to reaction rates. In reaction rates, uh, each of the different steps of the mechanism, each of the different collisions in the mechanism, happen at a certain speed, okay? The first one might be very fast, the second one might be very slow, and the third one might also be really fast, okay? So uh, before I go forward, I want to say this. A collision happens between two particles. If you see a collision happening between three particles, something's wrong, okay? Just keep that in mind, all right? It's much more common for two particles to collide than for three particles to collide at the exact same time with correct orientation 
to produce a reaction, okay? So if you see three particles on the reactant side of any elementary step, you know something's wrong, okay? It's okay for it to produce three particles, you just can't have three or more, for that matter, particles on the reactant side of any elementary step, okay? Anyway, back to what I was saying. The collisions, the elementary steps in the reaction can, have at diff can happen at different speeds, okay? If we are given the mechanism for the reaction like we're given here, we can figure out the rate law based on the slow step. The slow step is therefore noted as the rate determining step. So, if we look here, the rate uh, determining step has C bonded to two hydrogens and a free oxygen in its reactant side. Okay, based off of that information, we can then go and say that the rate equals K times the concentration of CH2 times the concentration of O, okay? And uh, let's just say, for example, that this used two free oxygen atoms, then this would be second order with respect to O, okay? That's how you determine rate law with respect to a mechanism, an elementary step, okay? The most common way that this is uh, given to you on the AP exam is they give you a reaction rate and they give you a list of four mechanisms to choose from. And they tell you which mechanism is likely the correct mechanism to represent this reaction rate, okay? Often, uh, this is usually how the choices are structured. Two of the mechanisms they give you uh, will have the correct step, but it won't be the slow step. Two of the mechanisms they give you will have the correct step as the fast step. And if it's the fast step, it's not the rate determining step. So the mechanism doesn't apply. The other two will have the correct step as the rate determining step, but they will have it as like, they will have another step in the mechanism, they will have a, a separate collision apart from the rate determining step, that is a collision between three molecules. And that's going to be incorrect, okay? Okay, so another thing that they uh, include in this unit is the potential energy graph of a reaction, okay? so. This reaction right here, this is a reaction of combustion, okay? A reaction of combustion is exothermic. Exothermic means it releases heat, endothermic means it uh, sucks up heat. Endothermic means that it removes heat from the environment, okay? So that pertains to our potential energy graph. Let me draw a little graph for you. Potential energy graph on the x-axis is graphed time, on the y-axis is graphed potential energy, okay? So the reactants would be up here, okay? This would have some activation energy hump like that. And then once the activation energy is, re is achieved, the reactants descend down to a lower state of potential energy, okay? So. This is a basic graph, and you would probably be asked to label stuff on it. On right here would be the potential energy. Why did I write FB? This would be your potential energy of your reactants. Reactants, I butchered that spelling, cantons. Over here would be the potential energy of your products. Potential energy, by the way, is measured in kilojoules or kilojoules per mole. This to the potential energy of the reactants is our activation energy. Again, it's abbreviated EA. This change from here to here is the energy released in the reaction or if, if, if we were going this way, 
and this would be the energy absorbed in the reaction. This, top, this point right here at the very top of the graph is called the activated complex. You think it's the activated complex because it's already absorbed all the activation energy. Potential energy in kilojoules per mole is something we call delta H. We're going to talk very much in depth about delta H in our next unit. It's called thermodynamics. Okay? So, um, moving on from there, let's take a trip back to our mechanisms, and let me introduce to you something called a catalyst. Okay? Let me think of a reaction we do in organic chem that features a catalyst. So, this would be an example of a reaction that features a catalyst, okay? The catalyst being uh, the opposite of an intermediate. An intermediate is something that is produced and then consumed. A catalyst is something that is consumed and then produced, such that you start with the catalyst and you end with the catalyst. The concentration of the catalyst never changes, okay? So the reaction mechanism for this reaction I just gave you. So um, this is the reaction of dehydration of two alcohols into an ether. If you don't know what that means, good, you don't need to. This is just me nerding out from organic chem. Anyway, so this is our overall reaction, and these are our three elementary steps in the mechanism, okay? H2SO4 is consumed, notice and H2SO4 is reproduced, all right? Therefore, H2SO4, also known as sulfuric acid, I hope you know that, sulfuric acid is a catalyst, all right? Catalysts increase the reaction rate, or they make the reaction possible in the first place. Now, they may do that in two ways. They can either, A, grab hold of the reactants and orient them specifically to collide at the proper orientation all the time. That's what an enzyme does in biology. In an, uh, an enzyme grabs hold of one reactant and forms a complex. A complex is just like very strong IMFs. Forms very strong IMFs with this guy and holds it here. It takes another reactant, forms very strong IMFs with that guy, and it holds them in the proper orientation until they react. Okay, that's an example of a catalyst that increases rates by uh, increasing the uh, proper orientation collisions. A another uh, type of catalyst is a catalyst that, once introduced, allows the reaction to follow a completely new mechanism. Okay, so this reaction right here, if I removed the sulfuric acid on both sides, then uh, this reaction would proceed. It would still proceed, but you would need much higher pressures and much higher uh, temperatures in order for it to proceed. And it would follow a different mechanism, okay? Because this mechanism is only possible because of the presence of H2SO4. Now, when it makes it follow a new mechanism, this new mechanism has a lower activation energy, okay? That's why the catalyst increases the rate. It lowers the activation energy necessary for a successful collision. Okay, so if you look here, you know the same rule still applies. All the uh, components of our mechanisms, when we cancel out our intermediates and cancel out our catalysts, I shouldn't have wrote the uh, chemical equation like this, you never write chemical equations with catalysts. Now that's H2O plus H2O, but you never write chemical equations with catalysts because in your reaction mechanisms, you do cancel out catalysts. Okay? Uh, did I forget something? I may have forgotten something. This is supposed to be plus H2O here. Okay. So, again, on this side we have... 1 C2H5OH, 1, C2H5OH2, cation, this cancels with that, C2H5OH, that's our second one of these, this cation cancels down here, H2SO4, anion cancels with this guy, 
we have an H2O that's present over here, and we have C4H10O present over here. Once you cancel everything out, the reactants are on the reactants, and the products are on the products. There we go. That's Unit 5, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in.